Uh, okay, so let's start um, Genesis 35, verses 2 to 4. We need taller people in this place, so I don't have to keep... <laughs> so Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they have gone, gave, excuse me, so they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were on their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And Father God, we pray as I, as I preach here, Lord, that this is a message from your heart. I pray open ears and hearts and minds. And in the name of Jesus, I cast off everything that would block the message and the flow of the gospel Amen. and the truth of your word. And right, Lord, we pray for fertile ground to receive the seeds of your word, to receive the witness of the Holy Spirit and your fire to come upon us, God, to let us, each of us know as we hear the word that we are quickened and alivened to know that our Jesus lives. We praise Amen. you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And what I wanted to focus on was particularly verse number three, where it says, has been with me wherever I have gone. The God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. We all know that the name of Jesus, as he was, uh, as he was being, um, coming in as Savior, he was declared Emmanuel, and that means God with us. Uh, that is verse uh, Matthew 1.23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Amen. God with us. The presence and the power of God. With Jacob, wherever he went, through every stressful situation, and every trial in his life, and in ours as well, God with you, God with me. That is what makes our Christ different. He is not a God who is far off. But the veil has been torn so that we can enter into the Holy of Holies. We never have to be alone without Jesus. God with us. Amen. But this, there is a difference between having God with you and acknowledging his presence. God is inside you. If you have believed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit inside you. That's what the Word of God says. He can't be any closer. Inside me, I am the temple of the Lord. That's what the Bible says. Wherever I go, I carry His presence. Amen. Amen. I am never without Jesus. But I may be without the acknowledgement and the awareness of His presence. So many times people will say that as we call on the Holy Spirit, they say, well, he's already here. Because the Bible says whenever two or more uh, meet together in my name, there I am also. Yeah. But you can have a thousand people meeting in the name of Jesus and not be aware of his presence. And that's the difference. That's why God manifests among us. He will show signs, wonders, miracles. He will touch our hearts and there will be a palpable sensation that God is with us because we have focused our attention on the fact that God is with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I invite a guest over to my house and he sits in the living room and I turn on the television mm -hmm. and I eat my Cheetos and uh, I never talk to the guest and the guest is just up there like this, very quiet guest, a very sincere, loving guest, but he's not the guy who will just scream out at you. He won't say, hey, I'm over here. What's wrong with you people? You invited me to your house for dinner, but you haven't talked to me. This guest is amazingly important and powerful and loving and desires communion and conversation with you, but you have chosen to let him sit, the royal king, in the living room while you're eating your Cheetos, watching your TV, worrying about your next problems, cursing out the person that wasn't nice to you that day, worrying about your money that you don't have, and the king, the most wealthy man of all eternity, the creator of everything, sits alone, 
silently in the dark, waiting for someone who invited him in the house to acknowledge his presence. What good does it do to have the powerful Jesus Christ in your church if you don't even acknowledge that he's there? Or in your house, or in your Bible study, or in your worship, or in your message, if you aren't thinking about Jesus. You know, many times, uh, particularly recently when we were preaching in the other church, I'd look out and, and some, even a pastor, he would fall asleep every time I'd preach. Now, I could take that personally, but I saw other people who were awake, so I assumed it wasn't me. <laughs> Every time I'd start preaching. Now, if you fall asleep, I think there's something in value. There's value in the Word of God if I'm preaching, right? I don't tend to bore people, I hope, when I'm preaching. I don't know. I could be wrong. Uh, but uh, the minute I opened my mouth and started to read Scripture, that person would fall asleep and so would one other person. Boom. Now, that is not acknowledging the presence of God. You see, if you know that Christ is in the room, that his eyes are eyes of fire, that he is filled with power and passion and love, that he desires you, that he is the king of glory, that he has opened the doorway to heaven for you and me to go for eternal life, who has rescued us from hell, Amen. who has released the power of the Holy Spirit, he is the miracle maker. He is our healing oil. And I go to sleep. I don't care who's preaching. But if you read to me about Jesus Christ, I can focus. I can see he is in the room with me. When I don't, It doesn't have to be the best worship music. But if my heart and my mind are focused on the King of glory, I am awake. I am alive. I am quickened in my spirit. And I can feel his presence. And sometimes I can hear him talk to me. Yeah. Like last Sunday. I just... Uh, you know, it's just many times when he speaks to me, it's a quick, just a little tiny thing. And it just makes me cry <laughs> in a good way, right? So he says, you know, son, don't worry, or something like that. But I heard it. You know, it's, uh, you're not sure if it's your ear or your heart. But I heard him speak to me, and I, weep, I wept, and I could feel his hand on my shoulder. Why? Because I was already focusing on the fact that he was there. I didn't know he was going to speak to me. But you make an opening when you acknowledge your guest in the house. How are you, Jesus? So glad you came to my house today. I'm so thankful to have you here, Jesus. I'm so glad. You, you, I can feel your love, Jesus. I know. I can look at your eyes, Jesus, and I see sincerity. I see warmth. I see compassion. I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention to you when you first came in. I, I like this TV show that I like to watch all the time. Well, this pertains to me directly because God has been telling me to get rid of my cable TV for a long, for about a year. And I have been reluctant to do it because I have other members in the house. <laughs> and I don't want to impose what he's saying to me. So I, But I did recently, I hope nobody hates me for this, but I cut back cable so now it's just the local stations. I don't watch it at all anymore. Yeah. And this has freed me in many ways. Because now, I'm, it's amazing. I don't watch that much TV, but I don't have much free time either. Right? So now, if I don't have a lot of free time, and then I spend 75% of that time watching these TV shows. I mean, maybe I only watched an hour and a half a day at the most. But now, I've taken that out. So now I have the whole two hours of freedom that I used to share with God, and I would share it with the TV show. But now I have more time. But you know what? It wasn't this that time. It was the fact that he requires my obedience. And I had heard him telling me, cut this thing out. So it was the act of obedience that I feel rewarded for. So, you know, there, when I first got saved, when I first accepted Christ, <laughs> I remember going to work. With, I always carry a Bible with me. I have never, since I got received Jesus... I've taken a Bible with me wherever to work, wherever I'm working, whether I'm traveling or going to the office, and I can feel him. The moment I got saved, I can feel him go from my head down into my heart. He's never left me. I can feel him when I go to work, but the intensity after I got saved, it was just, uh, I, just overwhelming. 
Now, I have never felt him leave me, but I do feel that there are times when my focus is not as strong on his presence, and then I start to get carried away doing bad, you know, not, not really connecting with him. Not doing God things. I'm doing Bill things. Uh, now, none of us are perfect, but uh, <laughs> the, the Lord always talks to me through different mediums, through people and things, and I'll just keep getting this message. It's like he's writing things to me with different channels. Uh, it can be a preacher I listen to, or it can be a book I'm reading, or it can be something that someone tells me, or something I'm reading in the Bible, or he just speaks to me. So over the past several weeks, he's been speaking to me about the awareness of his presence. And one book in particular, I don't know how I ended up buying this, but I've heard of it before, uh, and it is by Brother Lawrence, and it's about the practice of meditating on the presence of God. This book is so simple and basic. I mean, I'm, I'm reading this stuff. It's almost like I'm going to laugh. Like, uh, this is all there is to it? But yes, this is all there is to it. Let me tell you about Brother Lawrence so you can help put in perspective of what I'm talking about further. Brother Lawrence uh, was a bodyguard, in all effect, for a treasury, a very wealthy man in France in the 1600s. And um, he was clumsy, and he was always making mistakes. And he felt like if he would join a monastery, that it would be penalty for him, you know, it would be punishing to him, and it would help, like, punish him for best being a bad, a bad person, a bad worker, a bad bodyguard. <laughs> So he didn't go into the monastery because he expected to find God. He went into the monastery to punish himself and withdraw from society. And as he did this, the one thing that he, he saw a tree one time during winter, and it had no leaves on it. But it preceded the promises of God bringing spring. And he never forgot about that. And it's not fully explained in the book how this transformed him. But he knew that even though he were a leafless tree, that God was going to bring about a fruitful harvest. It was coming because he promised it. And he just focused on God. In the monastery, there wasn't a lot of TV in the 1600s. Uh, you know, there was nothing to distract his attention. Well, you would think. But he did have one thing. He was in charge of the kitchen. And there was food, but there was also a lot of work and noise. And this is a French kitchen. I wish I had that job. I, mean, at least I don't know if I could cook, but I could eat. <laughs> and uh, there were guys talking. There's plenty of noise, and he's always busy. But one thing Brother Lawrence set out to do was to never, he would consciously think about God at all times. So he would go from prayer, and then he would go to worship, and then he would go to work in the kitchen. And at all times, whether he's cutting carrots or stirring soup, he would put his mind on Jesus. Now, he says that in the first year, it was very hard. All he could think about it was his sin and his failures. Every time he thought about God, that's all he thought about. But he, wanted to, he knew God was loving, kind, and forgiving, but the first thing in his mind was his sin. After four years, he starts to get better. And now, more often, he's th he can think about the, the love of God, the mercy of God. After 10 years, it becomes an ingrained part of his well-being. His life had changed and continued to change after 10 years. He said, for 10 years, it was still a struggle. But I continued on. I never let it bother me when I failed. And when I sinned, I never let it separate me from God. I confessed my sin, and I moved on. And again, I would just think about the love of God. Focusing on the love of God. For 40 years, he did this. And people that met him noticed he was different. <laughs> Surprise. He was humble. He was loving. He never got mad. He was always graceful. He always had wisdom. He wasn't a well-educated man or wealthy or anything, but he could simply and sincerely give the best advice to everybody. Cardinals, the hierarchy of the church, would notice this guy because he was so different. He had been transformed by meditating on the presence of God. But to meditate on the presence, we have to know who he is. Right? Yeah. You have to believe he exists before you can acknowledge that he's there. So faith starts the process. It is all about faith. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I believe he's my Savior, my Lord. That's the beginning. And then I believe he's present with me. 
that he's watching me. He hears everything I say. He knows the battle and the struggle of my heart. But I also have to know, because the word of God is important, it describes him to me. There are a lot of theories about who God is. I work with people that all believe in God, but they don't believe in Jesus as their only Savior. But the Word says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody Amen. gets to the Father by, but by me. And you cannot have the Father if you do not have the Son. This is all in the book of John. Yeah. I and the Father are one. Right? So, uh, but they will say, but there are many ways to God. There is the Muslim way. There is the Hindu way. There is all of these ways. There are even is their own way. You know, everybody, some people have their own religion. They don't believe in all the religions, but they say, but I know, you know, I believe in God, and I have my own th theory. Yeah. So they now have their own religion. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they'll say, I like Jesus. He's a great guy. Dude, you're awesome. He says, no, I died for your sins. I'm the son of God. If you don't believe in me, you won't go to heaven. You cannot have eternal life. Read the Bible. Yeah. You can't, Jesus makes it very clear there is him or nothing. And you can choose him or you can choose the 5,000 million other gods that are out there. But you can't have them all together. So once we get to that, now we can focus on, yes, Lord, I believe you, I trust you, I'm going to meditate on you for the rest of the days of my life until you change me. So what Brother Lawrence didn't do was worry about his failures. He didn't worry about his sins. He confessed them, but then he moved on. And it was over time, spending time in the presence, in the presence of Jesus, that his life changed. It wasn't on penance. You know how Catholics do the rosary and all that stuff? He said, no, I never did that. And this was a time when the Catholic Church was in charge. So he didn't do it, even though that's what the Catholic Church... No, he focused on Jesus. He focused on the Lord. Now, you'll notice that if you haven't been focusing on the Lord outside of worship or outside of Bible study, or outside of this, the church, it's really hard to focus when you do those things. Right? If you're not thinking about Jesus the way Brother Lawrence tells us to, when you shift from your focus of the world to prayer, it's hard to pray. It's hard to focus, even when you turn off the TV and the lights, and you, and oh Jesus, you know, your mind starts to wander. Well, Brother Lawrence after he did this for so many years, he said there was no difference between working in the kitchen or being on my knees and praying to God. It was all the same to him. Uninterrupted. Constant prayer. What does the Bible say? Pray without ceasing. But if you're praying to your imaginary friend or somebody else's God or some other thought or something that you were taught, it's not the same. It's the personal relationship. It's the awareness that your friend is in the house. Your friend is with you all the time. Now, as I've been trying to do this more and more, I feel better and better. It's not a surprise. Now, it took him 40 years till he died, and he still didn't get it completely right. But after 10 years, he was in a habit of doing it. What if we tried this for 10 years? Now, most people will give up. I, I'm determined not to give up. Because he already enabled me to feel and know his presence before I even read this book. I was already aware of his presence from the time I got saved. So, uh, it's just a reminder to me. Now, many people, they have worry and they have sin. And the focus turns from Jesus to the problem and on the sin and the failure. And Brother Lawrence sets the exam says, we're all sinners. I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. But I will focus my time, my life, I will focus on Jesus. While we focus on him, we are nourishing our souls. The soul needs to connect to God. But if the mind keeps running away onto every other thought, on every other worry, onto every other activity, the soul never gets nourished. Now, you know, how can you come, but I see it all the time, people will they'll come in and we'll have worship music going on and some are crying and others are like, when is this going to end? I can't wait to get out of here. Huh? That's the difference. Those that are sucked into the love and the presence of God, they got it. At least during the worship time. But those that they can't wait. Oh man, what, another song? Huh. <laughs> Heaven's going to be an awful place for somebody to get, <laughs> if they make it. <laughs> you know? That's, uh, that's going to be really bad. Because this whole process, while we're in the earth, is to bring heaven to earth. It's a, it's a sampling of things to come. What are we going to do in heaven? Is everybody going to have a TV? Mm -mm. Okay. <laughs> 
Is everybody going to have a problem they can worry about? No, intimate. Uh, intimate. It's all about worship. It's about focus on God. We may have tasks to do, but it is all through growth and personal relationship with Jesus. Now, here's the thing. We started off that way. Adam started off that way. It was just him and God. What did Adam think about before Eve came? <laughs> so he was a bit lonely, uh, apparently. God thought so. But Adam didn't say, I need a wife. God said, I'll, yeah. I'll give you this. Yeah. I think it was just a challenge. Him. <laughs> Let's see what you do with relationships with people. <laughs> Let's see if you'll still focus on me when you have a wife. But the, the objective now is for all of us to go back to the garden. That's where we're headed. And God's redeeming us into that one relationship with God. When we die, we might have wonderful marriages. We have such rich love for one another and between a husband and wife. And it's just awesome. It's just perfect. But when you die, it all goes away. You know, Are marriages ever that perfect on this planet? No, they're not. And if your marriage isn't so great, i got good news for you. It's going to end. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but, but we love one another to the best of our ability in the marriage now. But forever, you will be married to Jesus. Your spouse, husband or wife, he's a hybrid, uh, will be Jesus. He has yeah. one bride. Yeah. He's waiting for the bride, and that is us as a body. All of us together, we represent one bride. Jesus is in love with one person. It's called the body of Christ. It's called the bride of Christ. And you and I are a part of that when we receive him forever. The perfect marriage, the perfect relationship. Jesus says, when they, they challenge him, they say, well, what happens when uh, a man dies and then he follows the law of the, uh, of, the, of the Jews and he marries that woman, a brother marries her, and he goes through this like seven times. They've all been married to her legally. They've all had her. What happens in heaven? Because these were the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So they were trying to trick him. You know, you, you uh, seven men married legally to one woman. No adultery, no, no divorce, nothing. They just died, and then another one married her legally, which was the obligation of a brother at that time. And then Jesus says, you don't know the scriptures, and you don't know the power of God. He says, you will rise like the angels. You will be in a heavenly body, and you will not be married in heaven the way you are on earth. You will have Jesus Christ. It will only be you and Jesus. And our whole goal, even though we are to love other people, and we are to evangelize, he says, go, preach the gospel to the ends of the world. But our foundation... Our strength and our ultimate purpose is the Adam-God relationship. It is the you and God alone. Amen. And Brother Lawrence, in his habit of practicing on the presence of God, formed the habit of seeing himself alone with Jesus everywhere, through every situation. Even when he was helping other people, serving other people, working with other people, he was still able to balance the relationship with everyone else but he always maintained God and me alone, Jesus and me alone. That's the ultimate objective. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So now, when people disappoint me, when people <laughs> don't show up for church or they come or whatever they don't, whatever they do, it's up to them. <laughs> um, I am focused on Jesus. Now, this applies directly to what just happened to us. We, we just had an opportunity to be in that bigger church and and I wasn't going to compromise. You know, it's about, I want Jesus. I want the Holy Spirit. I don't want thousand people who think I'm cool. It's not about that. <laughs> we can be with Jesus here. We can be with Jesus in the closet. We can be with Jesus in the prison like Paul was. Amen. I don't care where I am. If I make it my habit of Jesus and me, the presence of God. Yes. And the Lord's been speaking to me, and this was so amazing. Yesterday, I got a call from a guy. I don't know him at all. He's an Indian man who lives in Washington State. And he calls me, 
And he says, hello, do you speak Tagula? Or their, his local language, to, I forget what it is. One of my sermons got translated in India to that language. So I think somebody must have listened to it. And they said, oh, when you go to Washington, D.C., go look up this pastor. So wow. I'm guessing, because he didn't tell me the whole story, but he asked me if I spoke that language. And I, I said, no. <laughs> I said, uh, I said uh, by the way, how do you, he, we were talking, and I, he's out here to visit his son, who's having the child uh, dedicated to the Lord, and, and, um, and then I said, well, how do you know me? Like, well, where'd you get my, I'm in the basement here. <laughs> I'm in the basement in Fairfax. How do you get my number? And um, he said, oh, a friend of mine told me I should look you up when I come out to the Washington area. I, honestly, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And then, uh, but he's seen it. He's a very sincere, nice man. And he's, a, you know, he's an engineer and he's not, like some people call me for money and stuff. <laughs> he didn't want any money. He just wanted to talk to me. And he didn't even want to come to church. He just wanted to talk to me on the phone. I thought that was interesting. So in our discussion, he starts saying, I'm in the Brethren Assembly. I don't know much about their... Mm -hmm. But one, this is the thing that God had for me. They meet in houses. Mm -hmm. He said, Acts chapter 2. And I thought he was going to talk about the Holy Spirit. He wasn't talking about that. Mm -hmm. He said, in our churches, we follow Acts chapter 2. And I'm thinking, oh, cool, you got the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. No. Daily, they break bread together. Mm -hmm. They are formed on families and friendships and relationships, yeah. and they share their lives together in loving community. Yeah. And we were both saying, praise God. I said, that's what the Lord's been telling me, and I know that's why you called me, just to validate what the Lord's been telling me. Don't worry about the big box church. you got a thousand people who don't care about you meeting together every Sunday. That's awesome. Awesome, it's awful. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, they don't even give you 10 inches in the parking lot to get out. They're jamming on the, on the gas to keep... This it happen, right? Yes. When you're walking through the hallway with all those people, do you think they're loving you? I'm, I'm, I'm getting my coffee. Where's the Starbucks? I saw them, you know, every, every yeah. Sunday we drive by this one big church, and uh, they have this guard to let the cars out, and they're just getting out of there as fast as they can. <laughs> Make them exaggerate. But I mean, you know, usually it's like, oh, well, I don't really connect with people in this large church, so I can't wait to get out to be with my family when the service is done. I see. See, for us, we're blessed. I'm not going any place, baby. I'm in your house. <laughs> I'm with you, sweetheart. I'm with the people I love, I cherish. And God's been telling me to go small. And you know what? Even, and please don't do this, but if you all left me, I have to be prepared to focus on me and Jesus. Amen. And then, even if you did all leave me, I still have God. Jesus, it's the ultimate, it's my direction should be inward. See, the discovery of the Lord, everybody's looking outward. They do these routines, they do ceremonies, they serve in the church. It's all activity and work. And where is God? Right. Yes. Sadly. In you. He says, I am in you, in John. John 14, 20. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. I'm looking for God in all the wrong places. Looking for love in all the wrong places. That's a song. Old song, country song. Too bad you guys aren't old enough to appreciate that. So he's inside me. If I want to discover God, I need to look inside. I need to focus on the presence. I need to focus on his love. Now, if you do this, and I know some of you do, you will feel him. And what I noticed as the more I'm doing this, it's not like I always see a face in front of me, you know, like I don't necessarily see Jesus' face, but I feel this huge presence, you know, like all over the universe presence, gigantic, powerful, all, but it's at peace. And it's with me. Huh? That's, that's it. And, and I... Feel, you know, sometimes I, I was tempted to get upset at people this past week, and I didn't. I just, well, I wasn't comfortable about the situation or the comment, <clears throat> but I instantly, I said, Brother Lawrence, let me just focus back on you, Lord, 
And you know, and the Bible describes my father as a loving father, my Jesus as my savior, my protector, my intercessor, uh, that I am already forgiven and blood washed by Christ through my faith. And that is him with me. And, you know, I prayed for a couple people this past week or two, one in my office and then one in the barbershop, or two in the barbershop, so several. Jennifer, you were, uh, you, we talked about last Sunday how you prayed for the homeless man and, and healed his foot and he accepted Jesus. And Manam, you prayed for the, uh, au pair, the uh, what do you call it? The nanny. Babies? Nanny. In Vietnam, and that she accepted Christ over FaceTime. Why? Because of the presence of God. And you see, you don't have to start and stop. When you're always aware of him, Amen. you know, you're not going to walk past the homeless person. Yeah, right. Because Jesus in you stops and looks. Yeah. Now you can ignore him. I've done that. And I gave you an example last Sunday when I actually had to ignore the Holy Spirit telling me to pray for somebody because I wanted to be on time. Now, if I were obedient, I wouldn't have cared about being on time. I would have stopped and prayed for that woman. Nevertheless, we're not perfect. Again, not perfect. And then, you know, you're ready to go because the Holy Spirit is in you. Now, you didn't give her a whole dissertation on the Bible when you talked to her on FaceTime. Mm -hmm. What did you tell her, Mona? Just briefly, what did you say to her? About God's love. God's love. And because you have the love of God inside you, the Holy Spirit takes that out and touches her. So, well, let me give you my Ph.D. dissertation on God. <laughs> She's not going to understand she, she's a simple woman. Maybe she went to, did she go to school? We Probably not very high. She went at all, right? Never heard of Jesus, probably. Okay. So now you can't do it on logic and information. You have to say God loves you and bring relationship and presence. Amen. That's transforming. And that's why it works among people like that, but it won't work in Northern Virginia so well. I mean, it does, but not... It's not like overseas. It's not like when we went and I preached to the prisoners in Hanoi and they all accepted Christ, right? Yeah. Never heard of them before. But I, the Lord told me to preach on the, the father love and, and my own testimony. And they all needed father love. And they recognized him right away when I brought the gospel and the love of God in that simple message. Nothing complicated. Brother Lawrence said that all of religion for him was just the love of God. Focusing on love. Can you imagine, really, what's going to happen to our brains, to our bodies, when we meditate continuously on the love of God? Do you think you're going to walk around angry or fearful? Perfect love casts out fear. If I keep focusing on the perfect love of God, that he loves me. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to create my own Bill Marshall Ministries for attention. Put my flyer out. Let's get the biggest church we can get. No, I can meet him here with you. I have some amazing things happening to me lately. And it's all from the basement. I got to pray for someone in another country who is going to run for president in that country. Yeah. And I prayed for the whole family, and the Holy Spirit broke out. Fell down to the ground. Got delivered and stuff. Got healed Addition inside. left. Addition. And I had, yep. Yeah, and I had prophetic words. Mm -hmm. Even for the future president. You yeah. pray. God willing. Yeah. And then, do you remember George? I talked to you about George. In uh, India? Uh, yes, he's uh, Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Okay, so now George doesn't, because I'm not, I try not to be on Facebook all the time because it breaks my thoughts of the presence of God. I do it, but it's more, what is God saying to me, so I try to share it with people. But I don't want to be on there looking for attention all the time. See, that's, that's the opposite. Yeah. We, want to, we want God in us. That's our audience, not everybody else around us. So we have to change our perspective. But anyway, so George noticed that. He talked to me yesterday. And he said, uh, Pastor Bill, Pastor Bill, um, brother, I miss talking to you because you're never on Facebook anymore. I said, oh, sorry, George, you know, I do it on purpose. And then he's so excited, and, and I'm trying to, actually, at that moment, I wanted to worship God, and he's, he keeps talking to me. So I said, okay, all right, maybe God wants me to hear this. Um, so he uh, starts telling me, uh, we had another outreach with Muslim school children, uh, street children. 
So he has 90 Muslim children from the streets. This started off with just like four kids when I first uh, started yeah. to pray with George. I, I prayed with George and over over face uh, time or over uh, Skype, Sky. the Holy Spirit touched him and he, you know, he had manifestations of God on him. He could feel it was, <laughs> and I, um, but anyway, I taught him how to do deliverance over over Skype, and he did it, and he was able to cast out uh, demons because of what I told him to do. And his wife. Oh. <laughs> and um, now George had never prayed for the sick when I first started to talk to him. And I said, George, when you go into a Hindu or Muslim community, why are they going to listen to you? Mm -hmm. you know, he's Baptist, but he's, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I said, George, you can't keep God inside. You have to release him. Yeah. They, they need what you did. You know, they need a supernatural touch of God to tell them he's real. Amen. So I don't know what he's doing. But he did share a few testimonies, mm -hmm. old women he prayed for, and, and, and I gave him some money, and he was able to buy cloths for the women to... Uh, make dresses and books for the school children. So we, we do, uh, we're supporting him through our church. I've told you that before. So we paid for this month. He never asked for the money. He just, he shows me the pictures of all the kids showing up and, and him, him worshiping and, and witnessing to them. And then um, I said, oh, that's great. And then, then he'll tell me, oh, I haven't gotten the money yet for the $92 I borrowed for the, so I said, okay, George, I'll send you the money. No problem. Um, all right, now on top of this, now George has gone from just being the worship leader, youth worship leader in this one church, he's now in charge of 21 youth groups at 21 Hallelujah. different churches. Yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> when did I start? Yeah, praise God. Yeah. Yeah. He's in charge of Bible studies with all of them. He's being asked to go and minister at conferences. Yes. Hallelujah. And, um, <laughs> and then uh, he said, oh, and by the way, everywhere I go, I pray for the sick and they get healed. I said, oh, George, you didn't tell me that. He said, Hindus get healed. Muslims get healed. So they're accepting Jesus in the streets. He said, but I can't do it in my church because it's a Baptist church. <laughs> and he said, Pastor Bill, thank you. Everything you told me to do, I've done, and God has blessed me. So here I am in my basement. And I turned, your basement, it's not even my basement. And so here I, I am. And I told Monique the, last night, I said, you know, Sometimes God has different ministries for us. In my heart, I would love to be George. You know, I'd love to be going out and, oh, there's growth all over the place. But what did God do? You know, I, I, I make it a practice of worshiping him every Saturday. I mean, at least that in the morning. With all my heart. And then I worship and, pr you know, pray every day. I'm always, a, so, but what he used me to do is an intercessor he allowed the power that he's put in me to be released into George, and now George's ministry is going Amen. off like yes. fire. Yes. Amen. And I saw that. I saw, I saw, oh, wow, George. First time or second time I prayed with him, I said, I see fire just going across Bangladesh, and it's coming out of you. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, there's nothing happening. Yeah. And, uh, but not here. Now, can I be a Brother Lawrence who's in the monastery, and I have this solitude with God, but I am an intercessor for presidents, for expanding huge ministries in, in third world countries? Can I pray for a man who has an awesome prison ministry that is reaching thousands of prisoners in Hanoi? Yes, I can. Amen. Tremendous Amen. power gets released when you are alone with the yes. Lord. Yes, hallelujah. And you don't worry. Like, I could be sick, man, why isn't my name on that ministry? Mm. No. If God put me in this Amen. room, He put me Amen. in my basement to pray for the power of God to be on yeah. Pastor Joshua, Pastor Trump, George. Trust and I mean, I'm seeing it. And they are acknowledging, he's acknowledging it. Yes. I mean, I do get feedback saying, yes, thank you for your prayers. Many times people will say, because of your prayers. I mm -hmm. uh, had a chance to, uh, that, that man that's running for office, uh, his uh, daughter came to our house, and she had, had a broken heart. Mm -hmm. And I prayed for her, and God, I mean, it was, I, I'm not going to describe the whole thing, but God set her free, and she Amen. was just yes. joyful and filled with love, and miracles happened, yeah. and um, uh, she been, hasn't been the same since. Yeah. Now everything in her life is restored. Opportunity, uh, family restored, everything. Yeah. But for me, I see frequently a rejection mm -hmm. and in, in this area, just all the time. Yeah. So, But my persistence has to be in the fact that God is listening to me and I am doing what He wants me to do 
for other people. Amen. Who gets the greater glory? Amen. The guy with the, this, his picture on the flyer and the $65 million airplane and on the TV channel mm -hmm. who's just sucking it all up for himself or the person who prays in the basement or prays at her job and never gets thank yous mm -hmm. and yet God uses them and the power yeah. gets out. Nice it's, it's, if you can humbly serve the Lord without the attention of people, yeah. He will, and all of that is accredited to you. Yes. He's the vine and we are the branches. All right, so we start off with that connection to Jesus, and now we start to grow, and then what grows off of us? It's all of this fruit. Yes. Am I bearing fruit by being in this basement and connecting with people around the world, and their ministries are, yes! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I can say gentlemen. You are connected through this. I mean, we are a body together. Mm -hmm. And you have tithed. You have sown your money into these ministries as well. It's not just prayers. We've all put, put money into yeah. these yes. things. Yes. And, and it, uh, when you're praying in your spare time, whenever, wherever you are connecting with the Lord, praying for someone else, yeah. uh, you are a critical component to God's expansion of the kingdom. Now, just yesterday I got a book. It's by Joseph Maloney. Um, I'm not going to get into all of this, but he was connected to a group called the Golden Candlestick. Mm -hmm. God showed them to have a menorah. Mm -hmm. God showed me to have a menorah. Right. This was all amazing to me. Yeah. This is back in the 30s, 40s in California up to the 1950s. And the, there, were, there were 20 Bible students in California, in this part of California. And God spoke to each of them and said, Come and, you know, I want you to be an intercessor. I know your plan is to be a missionary or to have a big ministry someplace. Mm -hmm. But I want you to stay here in California mm -hmm. in the basement. And I want 20 of you to pray for everybody else. Wow. So they did. Mm -hmm. And miracles were just happening all over the place. I mean, being translated into another country to witness to somebody. And the opening of heaven and angels uh, appearing with them in the room. Now, this could get kind of weird and freaky, but the, you know, the, they didn't broadcast this. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they were having a tremendous effect by the, it's like an open heaven, to reach out through prayer and worship. They would worship seven hours a day, four to six oh, days a week. Wow. Worship and pray, seven hours a day. The one woman that led this thing, she would pray all the time, always on her knees praying. And she actually walked like this. Mm. She was crippled from years of prayer. Oh. They had prayed for 40 years like this. Oh. Huh. What, what would you want? Now, they were frustrated because they wanted to go out, but God kept telling them to stay in. Uh, there's another ending on this story, but I'll, I'll leave that off. But um, they didn't say that this is what I want to do. They just said, God wants me to do it. And they did it for all of those years mm. until they died. All these old mm. people. It grew from 20 to 40 to 80 persons, and it never got any larger. But look at what we've experienced. Yeah. We've had tremendous miracles. Do you want to trade that so that you can sit with a thousand dead bodies in some church that puts on a show every Sunday? Or do you want to be at the center of God's will? Do you want to be at the center of the opening of heaven? There may be only one small door in all of Northern Virginia that accesses the kingdom of heaven, Amen. and maybe it's here. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Because we are aware of His presence. Yes. And we stay in that mindset. We stay in that in our soul when we worship, when we pray, when we study the Word of God, when we're alone, when we're at work. Yes. The presence of God. We can bring total transformation. We're already doing that. But it takes humility. And God's been dealing with me. I think it's quite obvious. You know, the most we ever had in one service was 46 persons, and that was back at Westgate. Mm -hmm. Ever since then... I've been successfully whittling this down to a, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to a powerful small force. <laughs> well, when, when, uh, when I was in the military, you know, I remember I was a, 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 an officer at uh, one of our exercises at Nellis Air Force Base. These are massive. And you can hear the F-15s flying overhead, and, and there's all these things going on, thousands of soldiers all over the place. And, um, but, uh, and that's effective for certain kinds of warfare. But when you want to go in and you want to rescue a prisoner that's held captive by terrorists, you don't send in this whole army. Because you can't find them. Yeah. yeah, and they'll run away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what you do is you have a Delta Force. You have a special forces right. team that 
comes in surreptitiously, takes out Bin Laden, for instance, yeah. and does it secretly. Mm -hmm. Huh? Uh -huh. The That's power right. of God can come in small packages. <laughs> the power of God can come and do what Jesus wants. He's not, look, remember, he came to save a few. I mean, he died for the whole world, but he also says, only a few will find him. Right. Yes. We're looking for the few. Amen. And he will direct our steps as he does. So don't worry. And this is, I'm talking to myself. Don't, don't worry about the size of the ministry. Yeah, I am not. But you know something? I look forward, and we just had a, that big, nice church. But I look forward to this because I don't feel like opposition when I come. In the other place, it's like, oh, do we have to hear about the Holy Spirit? Do I have to pray for people? You know, what's this thing about the love of God? And, why, why do we worship so freely? When I come here, I'm in my family. I, I, I'm with people who love me. Amen. I can feel it. Yeah. And I, I received, and so does God. The Holy Spirit knows He, yeah. can, he can come here. He's welcome. Yeah. Be conscious of small things. If He is in us, you bring glory to God in every small task you do, consciously. You see, it's God is judging us not by the works we do, but guess what He's judging us by? The love we put into each work, no matter how small. Okay, I have a small church, but I love my church. I love you. I love. I can say that, and I'm not fake. I uh, actually exactly. love everybody in my yep, church. Exactly. <laughs> can yeah. you say that about the big box church? Who does, the guy doesn't even know your name. All he does is take your money every Sunday, give you a story, to, huh? Mm -hmm. I love you, and I know you love me. Mm -hmm. I want to be in that church. I want to be in that house. Yes. Because God is love, not God is entertainment, not God is works. Not God is service. I mean, these are a mouthful of love. But God is love. He who does not love his brother does not love God. So our church is built on love. And it starts with that intimacy with God that we are perpetually aware of. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Buddy. God bless you. Thank you. Um, so now, don't be worried about the initial wandering of your mind. Yeah. So he had that problem too. It took him 10 years to really start to get this done. Yeah. 10 years of being a monk. Wow. I mean, he, did, he doesn't have the district. So now he also says that it is a grace of God to really do this, like to, to be completely transformed into this oneness with Christ. It, it come, like God will say, I've chosen Julie to do this, and you're going to do it really well. <laughs> I mean, it may take you the rest. You're going to be a standout. You're going to be so good at this, focusing on the presence of God. You'll be better than other people. But Brother Lawrence says that that's not right to say that it doesn't have a positive, lasting impact for everyone else. So maybe I am not this gifted person to do this so perfectly well. But Brother Lawrence says anybody who does, does this, and I, and I think we can attest to our own personal experience when we have done this to whatever measure. We can see that God uses us differently, that our life is different for the amount that we focus on this. We can become very good at this. And we can be completely changed by this. You know, maybe Brother Lawrence is the greatest example of all time. Well, maybe I'm an 8 and he's a 10. I don't care. I want to go to 8 because maybe right now I'm a 2 or a 1. <laughs> you know, I want to see how far I can go. How far will it take me and change my life and make me as fruitful as possible by being satisfied with the meditation of one, the meditation of God, Adam in the garden. And, and can I get to the point that it really is not a big difference from the time that I'm working, praying, worshiping, and, and it's just a, you know, it's pretty steady all day long. Maybe a little fluctuation, but I'm always aware of and desiring of the presence of God. Now, the more he did this, the more love he felt. In fact, he would be focusing on the love of God, and actually this happens to me once in a while. Not Maybe you kind of live there, but... Um, and as you focus on his love, it's just this overwhelming feeling of joy, and I, 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 sometimes I'll just laugh. 
And he had that. He said, I had to contain myself or I would have just been like a mess if I had just let this joy just overflow in front of people. So he's in the kitchen cutting carrots. He's thinking about the love of God. And all of a sudden, this overwhelming happiness and joy just starts to bubble up inside. And he wants to laugh. <laughs> and he, con he controls himself because nobody's going to get it. He's a kook. He's crazy. If he starts, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yes, cut his fingers. But just think about that. That's what heaven's like, right? This overwhelming joy, this overwhelming freedom and happiness. And as you begin, see, heaven on earth. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we start to open this window up through the meditation of God's presence, it grows and expands, and we get more. We can feel more. We can see more. Huh? You know, so the people that I know that meditate on God more, they have more revelation. They have more prophetic words. They have more dreams that are real. They, they have uh, words of knowledge. They, more people get saved through them. Yeah, so the more we spend in the presence, the more we focus on it. But this takes, it takes an effort. It takes an effort to keep going back and not to work, but don't worry about it. See, it doesn't, you don't want to make it a work. It's something I want to do, and I, I, I know if I keep doing it, I'm going to get joy, but God's not unhappy with me if I don't. So here's the thing. You're saved. Your faith has saved you. You're going to heaven, and that inexplicable joy is yours forever. Mm -hmm. But what he's saying is, while we're here, we have the opportunity to experience heaven. A measure of heaven. So I can live without it or I can live with it. It's my choice. But the more I invest in that, the more I invest in, in that intimacy with God, the love of God, focusing my attention, the more I'm going to feel peace. I'm going to have joy. I'm going to feel a loved, loved child of God. I'm not going to be lonely. You know, I've seen this throughout my career, and I did it myself. But... Um, you know, this desire to get fame or become overly wealthy or get a lot of attention from people through your people. I lived at one point just to say, well, I'm in the State Department. You know, I'm in the Foreign Service. I'm a captain in the Air Force. My goal was so I could tell somebody that I had that job or that title. It was pride. Now, I'm glad I did it, and I don't recommend laziness. But what, what we want to do, is, as God took hold of me, so it's not about that. You're not impressed. Who cares if you impress uh, the world? Yeah. Says, I'm not impressed. Is he impressed with your intelligence? Mm -mm. Look at what he's done. Why? Huh? We're not even a flea. Mm -hmm. Is he impressed with your wealth? Mm -hmm. Where does it come from? Okay. Is he impressed with the title of your job? No. God? Mm. His title is God. <laughs> Is he impressed with CEO? Is he impressed with diplomat? Is he impressed with shop owner? No. God, can I get this? Yeah. There ain't no title higher than God. I can't impress him. I can try to impress people. But guess what happens when we do that? They don't love you anymore. And you know, a lot of people are like, oh, look at what he did. But you are not benefiting them. All it does is create jealousy and envy many times. Pride. Or you become an item that they can brag about. Look at, look at my husband. Look at my wife. Look at me. It's me, right? Because he did it. Yeah. My son, my daughter. And God says, no. Not impressed. Holy Spirit doesn't flow any better when you do those things. In fact, less. Focus on the presence of God. People die of heart attacks because they serve the God of this world. They end up, maybe they have money, but a lot of people, they get divorced, and then the money they, they, they work so hard to get, it's, it's psh, half of it's gone at least, maybe more. Or you're, you're striving so hard at work, and then you do something illegal. We, we, I know people that are chiropractors, and... Um, they, uh, well, I don't know them personally, I just know the story. But anyway, they did something illegal. They became very rich. You have another one. Folks. Um, and then, uh, you know, they, they, lose, they lose the money. They lose, you're, you know. So, 
the temptation will always drive you away from a focus on God. Satan wants you to be consumed with Facebook, to be consumed with music, to be consumed with yourself, consumed with your own achievement. But he says, focus on me. And you know what? He also says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be given to you. I know that. I, I did it through failure. I, I got to the point in, in Peru where just completely like, I thought I had everything. And, I, and then I, I'm just like, God, where's your... I want you. I want your power. I want your presence. And then I'm prospering as these things are leaving me. You know, because now I'm not pushing people at work as much. I'm not, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to, you know, now I'm just saying, God, it's up to you. And then all of a sudden, you know, doors start to open and things start to go. Isn't that strange? It's the opposite. Satan has people deceived to serve the God of this age, this world. We don't need the stress. You can succeed without it by putting God first, by tithing. You want to be taken care of? Tithe. Or you want to be more than taken care of and have a nice house like this? Then give everything you've got. That's how you get it. And then you know God is blessing the dollars that you're investing. It's not you stealing, grabbing, cheating, lying, impressing. Kingdom. Kingdom is in me. God is in me. My value has to be eternal, not temporary. So as you're going to school, as you're going to work, you do a good job. But Brother Lawrence said before any act, he would think about God. During the act, he would think about God. And after the act, after he accomplished something that God blessed him, he thought about God and gave him thanks. You thank the Lord for this house. I thank the Lord for my promotion and my, my contract. I thank the Lord for you guys doing so well, you know? Seriously. I'm, I'm so, you know, but... We, we can't just get consumed by the doing. It has to be for him, with him, by him, thanking him. Amen. All right. Well, this has been a very important message for me and a very important week for me. Um, I, I hope that, don't, don't forget this. this is, remember, this is a habit. This is a focus. It's something we do all the time. It's not a me this is not just a message to hear. This is a transformation on how we live as like and it's up to us. Nobody's forcing. But the opportunity is there to just really, really prosper in God and be useful to Him. And to have peace and love and a fullness. So, you know, I believe a lot of the, the, the smallness of the church had to do with God getting to me to teach me this lesson. But, anyway. Why don't we, because we truncated our worship, why, why don't we worship, and you know, those who want to, and yes, do this. You know, this time, don't just sing. You know, picture his presence. Now, or just being aware of what you're sensing and feeling about him. And then afterwards, share. You know, got, but don't, uh, don't feel pressure. I shouldn't say that. But, it, you know, just the main thing is recognize his presence. Focus on it. And then if God shows you anything great, let's share it at the end. But don't make that your primary goal for this.